an evangelism conference for New Zealand. Get inspired, be equipped. Engage Conference, reaching your world one conversation at a time. So as you'll probably listen to me, you'll find out that I am not a native New Zealander, <laughs> but I married a Kiwi, so I think I'm okay. Um, I've been here about 17 years, and just a, a minute or two of background is I grew up in a very large Irish Catholic family in around a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. And from a very early age, I knew God, but I didn't really know God because as all good Catholics, my parents went to church at Easter and Christmas. And from a very early age though, one of the things that I do remember was that we were a family that struggled because of the amount of children we had. I mean, it was hard for my parents to put food on the table all the time and keep up with everything. And what I remember at that age is the Catholic Church came always to our aid in a community manner to help us, to nourish us, and to be alongside us. So my earliest memories of being a part of a community, of a loving, structured community, was being with people who wanted to be alongside us every step of the way. So I've been through many different kinds of churches and in the end married my husband, John Somerville, who's from New Zealand, born and bred. And that's why I'm here today. Now, John's father was, if anybody's Presbyterian, was a Reverend Dr. Jack Somerville in the Presbyterian church and therefore I have no choice but to be Presbyterian. So that explains that one. Now, I became a Christian way back in the charismatic renewal in my teenage years. And again, we were the ones, if you ever heard of things like Ann Arbor Mission Community with Wormer and Derek Prince. I lived in those communities. We bought houses together on streets and ministered to communities out of our houses. So to me, I don't know any other way. And I found it really interesting when I came to New Zealand and found out that the majority of our churches, and I have, you're welcome to disagree, but I think they're very insular. I think we work on a premise that we meet the needs of everybody inside, and if somebody outside comes in, cool. Mm -hmm. But the bottom is, the bottom line is, that is not what it's all about. When I took theology, I learned about a term called missio deo. And that is simply that we are called to have a mission for God. Anybody ever seen the movie Blues Brothers? They're always saying in the movie, I'm on a mission for God. If anyone sitting here doesn't believe they have a mission from God, go back to your scripture and your gospel and read it. We all are called to be gospel purveyors. We are all called to be alongside and mentor those around us. We may not all be called to be evangelical, but we are all called to love and serve our brothers. And like the scripture said, who are our neighbors? Everyone. You can't pick and choose who your neighbors are. So I often think about this scripture in Acts 8, 26 to 39, which I won't read the whole thing so we have enough time to discuss. But that's the scripture where Philip gets alongside the eunuch. And God calls him to meet up with the eunuch. And he sees the eunuch reading scripture and he says to the eunuch, do you understand? And the eunuch said, how can I possibly understand if someone doesn't tell me? How many people are outside of our church doors like that? Who, like they said at the talk earlier, right, before we came in here, have those questions, but nobody's there to answer them because we're busy in our little church walls doing the things we do every day in church, rather than actually saying, I'm fine on a Sunday, but the rest of the time, I'm going to go out and actually reach out to my neighbor. And in the end, that eunuch, did understand because of Philip being called there to help him and did end up being baptized and went on to be a great Christian for God. So what is our mission from God? It's about walking out God in the world. 
step by step and showing that to others. So rather than preach to you, even though that's a possibility, I want to talk about the missions that I've seen happen, not in America, because I know that sometimes New Zealanders go America, but what we've done right here in the last 17 years in New Zealand <coughs> through churches that are right in Dunedin. We formed a mission called Grubby Angels, one of my favorites. Grubby Angels is a group of about 15 adults and about 10 youth who go out about once every other week and go to elderly homes or those who are disabled and helps them weed their garden. And all they ask in return is a half an hour after they're done, a cup of tea and a conversation. That's been going on for about seven years. Another one is Soup at Sidey, which is probably my absolute favorite. Soup at Sidey began with about four people at Coast Unity Parish who said, how do we reach the least, the last, and the lonely in the neighborhood? How many people don't have a connection with somebody on a day-to-day -day basis and are feeling like they're not a part of something? How do we engage with them to make them understand that they are welcome, not just in church, but everywhere? And we didn't look for this to meet the need of somebody. We didn't want it to be a handout. We wanted to form relationships. And it took us about six months of about six of us or so sitting there every week with soup and buns, waiting for people to come in the door. When I handed that ministry over about four months ago, there is now over 60 people from the neighborhood attending, not because they get a free lunch, but because they have formed relationships with the people that come every single Thursday that they can talk to, that they can share with, and that they know those people are looking out for them. They have formed relationships. And very, very rarely is the word God spoken, which is another key element in a lot of these community ministries. And yet, very rarely does not someone ask, why do you do this? And God can be in the conversation. It's about mentoring by showing, not by talking. Another one is grandparent reading. I want you to notice as I mentioned some of these that they reach every level. Grubby angels would reach the elderly, but it also reached people that were incapacitated and couldn't do their garden. We had a 20-year-old man in a wheelchair that we did the garden for. Soup at Sidey generally, um, the majority of people that went were elderly, and there was a group called Stepping Stones that had people with mental illness that would come along. So there was a different variety of people. Grandparent reading was where we took elderly people from our parish that said, I don't know how to minister to the community. I don't have the energy. And we said, could you go into a school once a week for a half an hour and read a story to the young kids? that don't know how to engage with elderly people anymore and are afraid of them? Sure, we could do that. In just the general Dunedin area alone, we have over 75 grandparent readers every year in the schools who engage with the children, not only by reading stories, but also by saying, how are you today, John? And if John says, I'm not having a good day, we stop the story and say, tell me about it. Some of these kids have no one to talk to. This is how we can pray for them and mentor in a different way. When I was doing youth group, the majority of my, I ended about four months ago that ministry also, and there was over 50 teenagers in that group, raised up from about three. Majority of them, probably 95%, were not church kids. They were street kids. I said to them, how would you like to minister to the community? And they got talking about it, and one of the kids came up with this fabulous idea. And we did what was called rent-a-teen. So if you wanted your windows washed, call us up. We'd have a teenager come out. All we asked was for whatever you felt was equivalent koha that you could afford. 
And that money went back into the youth ministry for other things. We had teenagers washing windows, mowing lawns, babysitting, helping to cook meals, you know, different things, helping to plant gardens. And that was a flourishing ministry that really emanated out into the community, but also taught a valuable lesson to the teenagers doing it. The elderly in our church also bake. How many people have great bakers in their churches? I don't know any church, and I don't bake, by the way, I preach. So I love the people that go in and bake and sew and knit and do all those things, because those are all things I don't accomplish. But what I really like is the women in our church got to know these people at a house called Moana House. I don't know if anybody's from the South Island that knows Moana House. But it's almost like a rehab house for people coming out of prison and to help them segue back into society. And one of the ways these elderly women minister is by baking goods and taking it to the people at Moana House. And sometimes they sit and have a conversations with these former prisoners who now need to become integral members of the society. We used to run an after school program. I just ended nine years of running full day, full week long holiday programs from 8.30 in the morning to 4.30 in the afternoon. We would gather over 60 children, um, turn away at least 20 or 30. It was $5 a day to meet the needs of those that couldn't afford other holiday programs but needed to put their children somewhere. We ended up not only ministering to the children, but to the families. A key thing in all of these is they were not programs. They were not events. They were not projects. Because I think the problem with a lot of our churches is we come up with programs and events and projects. When in reality, what we need to do is get out and have relationships because people outside the front doors of our churches are crying out for relationship. I can guarantee you, if you're not in this generation, that those people that are in their 30s, early 30s and younger, are all about relationship. They don't want you to talk to them. They don't want you to actually tell them how to do things. They just want you to care about them and be able to share things with you and for you to participate in things with them. The millennial generation is a generation in need of some foundational relationships because they don't necessarily have that in their life. With the advent of technology, their whole world revolves around a screen. So to have a relationship with actual people is crucial for them. For them to learn to have a relationship with Christ is to be able to get alongside one of us and have a relationship also. Steve Taylor is the actual head of the School of Ministry at Knox in Dunedin. He's an amazing speaker. Recently he spoke about mission and ministry in the community. And he said one of the things that we always fall into a, a, a hard category in is that we we forget that we don't have to overplan things. Um, as ministers, now I'm not ordained, I'm a lay minister, but I know I've talked to many ordained ministers, and oftentimes we have committees. In the Presbyterian Church, I love it, we have committees for committees for committees for committees. And basically, I can honestly say one time when I was working with youth in a church, I had to go to committee to get a set of pens. So that gives you an idea of how committees work in the Presbyterian Church. I don't think it's much different in a lot of other churches. So when we come up with an idea of how to go out and minister in the community, our ministers will say, write it down, get a proposal, take it to session, see if they approve it, we'll take it over here, we'll take it over there. Steve Taylor says, screw that. We need to get back to being kids. We need to remember that in the middle of everything, there's a sandbox and it's okay to play. It's okay sometimes to just say, hey, I'm gonna just try this out and see if it works. I will guarantee you that almost everything on the list that I mentioned to you was never taken to a committee. 
we kind of did it backwards and went behind their backs. But they're the most flourishing things now because we did it out of the play sandbox. We decided we would try it and we went in with abandonment whether it was going to work or fail. We were just going to be there to commit ourselves to whatever we decided to do. Because we felt God was leading us to do that. He says, we are actually churches built for change. We have to look at it in that way. I mean, look at the scripture in John. And it is, I'm not going to read the whole one of that either, but we know this, hopefully we all know the story. John chapter 21, where he comes back to the disciples. And the disciples are fishing and they're casting out their nets off of the right-hand side of the boat, let's say. And they keep bringing it in. And what do they get? Nothing. Because they're doing it the same way. And he says, why don't you cast it off the other side? It's kind of like light bulb moment for them. Gosh, I never thought of that. We always did it this way. They pulled it out the other side, and they gather huge amounts of fish. I think that's what's happening in our churches too. We're casting out of the same side continually, wondering why things aren't working instead of going, hey, what's over here? Why don't we think in a different box? Think outside that little box and circle we've been in and move outward. Jono will probably laugh at this, but the truth is one of the reasons Jono hired me to be an alpha is that I am one of the most out-of-the-box thinkers. And since I've joined Alpha, I have not done anything the way they have told me to do it. <laughs> I had a nickname in the church that I just finished working at, and my name was called Pollyanna Rebel. Because <laughs> I can be a very naive thinker for an old lady, but I am quite a rebel. And I do like to shake things up, even for being quite an introverted person. And that's because I believe that God is a constant changing God. And if we do not change with God, we are stagnant. So our call in mission, in working in the communities is don't be outside it. We are taught to be outside a part of the world and we always argue with this. In this instance, our mission is to be part of that. Go out and join a community group, I did. Both the minister of the church I belong to and myself said, we're not going to just bolster that group. We're not just going to say, good job. We're going to be a part of it. We're going to get out there and plant flowers in the park, wash windows for the community businesses. We're going to do all that because that's what says that we're walking alongside. If we're not willing to get our hands and feet dirty, if we're not willing to be the hands and feet of God, then we're all going to become stagnant in our church pews going, where is everybody? So what do you think? Anybody have any conversations of things that they thought have worked? Just listening to what you were saying and just taking into account what Ellen was saying, um, that's sounding like a one-way bridge. But actually, so just, you know, I can guarantee I was a little bit I, Alan's not in here, is he? <laughs> I actually was a little bit disappointed in that because I disagree completely. Because we have worked for the last six years in the community. And nowadays, more and more churches, at least I know in the Presbyterian churches, are actually hiring and paying specific people to be missional community workers. That's all they do. Their job is to literally do whatever they have to do in the community. Their job is not to bring people in the church. But you know what? It happens. And if you're trusting enough, it will happen. I don't know how you can call it a one-way bridge unless if you're determined that the only way to do that kind of mission is to get bums on seats. Mm -hmm. And right. if your outlook is to get bums on seats... If you use the term souls in heaven as opposed to bums on seats. Exactly. Are you seeing that from these programs? Very much so. Very much so. Because that's the two ways. 
And that's, and that's what we go back to. I mean, another missional thing, and I'm not saying this because I'm with Alpha, but partially I am, is that doing the Alpha program is like that. I don't do go into churches and advocate Alpha so that you can get more people into your church. <clears throat> Alpha's not about that. It's about spreading the gospel. So if you get 50 people that come to your church for an Alpha program and three stay, praise God. But if you get 50 people and three stay, and you know that the other 50 walked away knowing Jesus, glory to God. I mean, that's really at the end of the day what it's about. God will take care of the rest. I mean, did our church grow from these programs? Yes. What percentage? 1%. But again, our outlook wasn't about that. Our outlook was being able to walk alongside people who needed relationship with God and really needed relationship with people. I think that uh, one of the things that you said was quite pertinent to the whole one, you know, one way bridge. If it's a program and the programs, if that is the program is the end in itself, then it easily can be mm -hmm. a one way bridge. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, but what you're talking about is not a one way bridge because mm -hmm. it's not a program. It's about... It's lifestyle, it's yeah, a relationship. And, and you're talking about different things that actually promote conversation, promote sharing mm. uh, the gospel and share, um, having life on life so that your words match up with your lifestyle. Um, one of the... Yeah, people, people seem to be crying out for that, but uh, we can easily short-circuit the whole pro pro uh, process because in our hope to reach people was like, oh, this program is working over there and we do the program and mm -hmm. then that's all it is. And that, and that would be something else that I wanted to say is that one of the things that you have to know is what is your neighborhood? What worked in my neighborhood, what I mentioned to you, I didn't mention to you so you can go, oh, grubby angels, I'm gonna go do that. If that's what your neighborhood is like, great, steal that idea. But you need to know what your neighborhood is like. What is it that their needs are in that community? You may have a community full of people that like dancing. Start a dance group, you know? Know what their needs are before you enter into it. I like what you said, and I think that's important, is that, like I said, if we're not going in there, there's um, a group called um, Presbyterian Support all over New Zealand. Um, in Dunedin, they're amazing. First of all, I'm not gonna cut them off of the knees. But one of the things when they engage in community is we find programs like that because they're connected to the government, they become less and less and less God-driven. Less and less mission-driven. And more and more of just a community handout or a help. That's where we fall into the trap. What I did by going through a community group, I didn't go through so that I could be part of the government system. I went through with the gospel. And if the gospel meant just living it every day, that was the difference. And that's how you're gonna see your difference in that bridge. If you're gonna go in with just a program, if you're gonna go in with just an agenda, it, won't work. it will be a one-way bridge. Yeah. Um, I have a young man that lives with me that's just about 20 years old. He started living with me almost every weekend, starting at 12 when his stepfather died rather suddenly at 29 years old. I have walked alongside Dan for the better part of eight or nine years. That's what it takes sometimes. You know, a lot of my youth, it wasn't, I, I love that term that they have now of 24 seven youth and working with youth. We should be 24 seven people with anybody. That's what Jesus is with us. Mm -hmm. I think that we do, I mean, we do need to have the agenda of seeing salvation. I think one of the problems we have is uh, a time agenda. Yep. Right, we've got to, we've got to see, you know, we've got to see some doing this program. I was listening to Joyce Meyer saying something like that the other day. If you're doing something and you're not seeing fruit, stop doing it. And I'm going, no. Yep. God said, do it. Um, I remember the Salvation Army back in uh, around the turn of the century when they reevaluated everything that they were doing and realized that they overbalanced on the social aspect of the social gospel and had neglected the gospel. And to quote Julian Bachelor, he's around, but with friendship evangelism, if you don't 
tell them the gospel is just friendship. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we can we can get out into the community and we can do all these wonderful community things and walk alongside. But if we don't have this agenda, this gospel agenda in the background of at some point speaking the gospel, then it just becomes mm. a thing we do in the community. And they go, oh, what a nice person that Mary is. Mm. But I think, and I agree with you 100%, but I think what you're saying as agenda is different than what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, if I go into the community and say I'm going to feed you and clothe you and burp you and make sure that you've got a, a, a ride here and there and that's my only agenda, then you will fail. <clears throat> you have to have that gospel message as your agenda. That's it. I think your comment about the church is built for change, is ready for change. Um, we, I think we need to get away from looking at bumps on seats. Mm -hmm. I think that our um, relationships that we build with our groups of people in whatever aspect that is, whatever the um, context is, that becomes a church in itself. If you, um, if you consolidate and have a group of people meeting on a reasonably regular basis, then that's still church. It's just different to what church has always been in mm -hmm. our heads. You know what I mean? Yep, very much so. <coughs> I have a question. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> so not everybody starts out that way and ends with a question. But we talk about community outreach and we, uh, we come up with what we feel that the Lord is speaking to us about and we go and pursue that with the desire that people would come to faith. We all know that we are living in an unseated generation and so <coughs> we're not a harvest country, but people do come to Christ. How important is the flip side of serving the community? Like we have these programs, or, we, or not for a better word, where we go in, and you talked about um, grubs and you talked about uh, various groups. That's us or Christians serving the non-church. Uh, how important is actually the non letting the non-church serve us as individuals as well? Because in a relationship, one person doesn't just, you know, I'll feed you, I'll, I'll clothe you, but you don't do anything to me. Because that's a bit of a lopsided exactly. relationship. Exactly, that's what I'm trying to so, say. So uh, in your experience, how have you seen that work? I think, I think the best example I can give you of that is that soup at Sidey. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people, when we first began, looked at it as, are you just going to do a handout? Are you just trying to feed people that can't feed themselves? I'll guarantee you that 90% of the people that go there can genuinely feed themselves. They don't go there for that. They go there to sit down mm -hmm. and have a conversation with somebody. It's not about give, 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 mm -hmm. or even take, take, take. It's about coming together and meeting in the middle. You know, it's about sharing our lives and sharing our stories. And I think that's really what's crucial about any kind of ministry like that. Um, and, and like I said, it's not that, I'm not saying that you never say God. I'm saying that there are God moments that are more important than just always talking about God. Because that's what I think has driven a lot of, especially younger people away. You know, I think there's a way to come in without being overpowering, but just being loving, compassionate, and, and caring and alongside. I think also um, <clears throat> one of the struggles I guess New Zealand has had because you have such a large uh, <clears throat> ethnic population within New Zealand. Some of the stuff you say is fantastic and I totally agree. And I wonder whether um, some of the things that we can do is to uh, leave a space for people to ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the things you're saying, is that, uh, uh, Rob, you were asking about, we've got to have that, that, that mission concept, and we've got to have that evangelism. I agree there too, but I think also, <clears throat> part of that mission concept is allowing them to see what we're doing with and for them, so that they can ask you about the faith that is within you. And with a lot of the ethnic cultures, that is a very important issue. It is. You can't come and say, you, know, you need Christ. You can't come and say, oh, you need to know the Lord. Uh, because it doesn't work. Exactly. That, that you've got to do something where they will ask you, what is it that's 
so different about yourself mm -hmm. to, to other believers. And that's exactly well put. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. And it isn't just New Zealand culture, although it's more prevalent here than a lot of places. And that is you can't go, you know, guns a-blazing into somewhere, you know, boom, 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 get to know Christ. Maybe once in a while you can. Maybe Billy Graham could do it. You know, but at the end of the day, in the culture we live in, especially, I mean, John and I have talked about the difference between North Island and South Island. I mean, I'm from Dun Dunedin. Don't go in Dunedin and tell anybody how to run their church. I mean, as an alpha person, I never go and meet up with a minister and say, this is what you should do. I go and meet with the minister and I say, how are you doing? What's up? What's new? How's your family? It's by having that kind of relationship that we begin to talk about what we can do for them as a church. But that's not any different than I've done with the 50 youth where most of them didn't come to church or know God. I mean, I, I'll never forget the day that I first introduced the Bible to them because I said, we're going to read scripture. And they said, what's that? I said, well, it's the Bible. What's that? I mean, when you're faced with the reality that 90% of the people outside the front door of your church don't even know what the Bible is, you have to start, like you said, understanding their culture. I mean, how many different cultures are there in, in New Zealand? We're a melting pot. I know for a fact that there is a church full of um, community-wise Maori people in our neighborhood. I never ever go into a conversation in that area with anybody in that neighborhood and look them in the eye. It's culturally insensitive. And that's why I said early, know who you're dealing with. You know, don't go in and ex have expectations except to get to know your community first and then just, you know, find where God is leading you in that. So, yeah, you're absolutely correct. I have found a great uh, place for outreach in a church in Hamilton. Um, we have a ministry called Converse, mm. where we get uh, <coughs> all sorts of diff different ethnic backgrounds who want to learn English. No one there, just to go and share with them mm. simply in English. I can't give the gospel to them because they wouldn't understand. They just come to learn English first, but you get to love these people. You get to know a little bit yeah. about them, little by little, baby steps. And uh, yeah, they it works. become part of your family, you become part of your family, <coughs> because they don't have any other family here. Mm. It works all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. another quick, we've got about five minutes, so. What's your definition of program? You're saying ministries, commissions are not program. Well, I, I see a lot of people that run programs, but they never really minister to people. Um, I have seen people run soup kitchens, which actually is a program that meets the need of feeding someone physically. But are they spiritually feeding them? Are they relationally feeding them? That's what I mean. I can run, I can run an after-school program all day long and have art projects for the kids. But if I'm not having a relationship with them, then it's just another program. It's just another thing to get money in the church or money in the door or whatever, you know. Exactly. Is that the love your yep. city thing that they run in Auckland? Or where they go out and they do nice things and they're told them you don't talk about Jesus at all, you just do nice things. And so yep. they go, well, okay, here's a bunch of people that did nice things. Yeah. What's the point? I think the difference that it could say for you know, something like a soup kitchen <coughs> would say if you had someone sitting on the table that was there to share life with people mm -hmm. and talk and spend time with them and have that spiritual connection and be available for answering the questions, then you then we would see that more as a community ministry. So and that's... As if it's, that we just provide you with soup. And that's something that we did at that soup on Thursdays. There would be anywhere from six to ten tables out, but one person from the community, from the Christian community, would always be at one of those tables. So that if conversation led in a certain way, they were able to walk alongside that conversation. You could almost, uh, according to your... Mission, you could almost say that sometimes on a Sunday morning that could be viewed as appropriate because there are people that go there that they don't connect necessarily. Look, I, I, they said 43 years of community work. Actually, it's 43 years of working with youth <coughs> and with children and preaching and that. Um, I've done community work off and on through those 43 years. But I can tell you the one that I find the most like that is Sunday school. 
I am working right now side by side with a young woman who is 24 years old, who 17 years ago was in my Sunday school, who is just now getting to know Jesus. Why? Why are we not doing something more in our Sunday schools? Because they are, at the end of the day, a program. A program to do something with the kids while the parents are in church. So unless if we're actually specifically looking at Sunday school as a ministry, as a mission, it will always be just another program. An evangelism conference for New Zealand. Get inspired, be equipped. Engage conference, reaching your world one conversation at a time.